Hey, it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Today, I've got Mark Teicholz. He's a fantastic guitarist, winner of the 1989 Guitar Foundation of America International Guitar Competition, and he's a professor at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. You'll hear us talking about this CD more in depth in our conversation, uh, but I'm going to play a sample from his record titled Valsiana, which is a really neat collaboration with GSI Guitar Salon International. There's 18 songs on this album, or waltzes, and for each waltz, Mark is played on a different guitar supplied by GSI. And uh, Mark has this gift and ability to just pick up any guitar and be able to play it instantly, uh, beautifully, without any need for adjustment. So I'm going to play one of my favorite tunes. This is the Usher Waltz by Nikita Koshkin. I used to play it all the time in high school. Um, I don't even want to think how many times I performed it, but it's still one of my favorites. Um, For those of you who don't know, this was actually inspired by the Edgar Allan Poe short story, Fall of the House of Usher. So you're going to hear some really uh, mysterious and frightening elements.
you've got this kind of natural ability to be able to just pick up a guitar you don't know that well and just play it very very uh very well because it's um it's tricky sometimes you gotta deal with different scale lengths you gotta deal with yes. different uh nut widths and all that and every guitar has a different response it do you find it, it takes some time to adapt or is it just something that kind of naturally happens for you i don't think i know the answer i know i've had chances to um to do it so maybe that is part of the answer i i did a a CD with GSI, Guitar Salon International, mm -hmm. and the the conceit of the album was that every piece was on a different guitar. Yeah, and we had a lot of fun doing that because we would we would take a piece that we thought we were going to record and then try five or six guitars and see which one which which guitar matched the piece, um, kind of like a casting call. Yeah, and um, so I had a chance to go through a lot of guitars and you know maybe I got better at it through that and also there's a collector in Berkeley named John Harris who has a beautiful collection mm -hmm. and I used to go through his collection a lot and I got to know it very well and so uh, you know I went I took these guitars with this sort of mindset of trying to figure out what could they do rather than, uh, I think some guitarists have just like the way they play, and then they just play, and the guitar either fits it or it doesn't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking so much about that. I was just thinking about like, oh, this guitar has this nice note here, or this bass here. It's a here. different aspect. Yeah, so I would just try to find it and hunt, you know, look for it. And maybe in ways it's just kind of another skill... That just needs practice to get used to. Yeah. Because a lot of classical guitarists or most classical guitars are very few instruments and they really kind of practice, perform, or concertize on just a single, maybe a couple different instruments. But you look at other genres for guitar, these steel string players, electric players, and they go, you know, if, if they're a big name, you'll see them in a concert and they will go through 10 guitars in a show like it's nothing. Right. And, you know, or the, violinists then pick up a viola. Yeah. Or a saxophone player will pick up a flute or yeah. a, yeah, alto and, um, to tenor. I, I hate in ways talking about guitars like, oh, if I get a question on oh, what you think is better, this or that, I really do not like that question. I mean, of course, there's instruments I'm not a fan of, but every instrument is so unique. Even yeah. instruments made by the same maker. Yes. If it's a very, even I when agree. it's a consistent maker, each instrument, the woods are going to have a slightly different sound. They're going to adjust slightly differently to everything. And it's, uh, I agree. I, I got really educated with, about guitars through the Valsiana CD and the, looking at many collections. Yeah. So I'm actually, I'm very experienced in having tried many, many guitars. And, and the result of that experience is that I have fewer opinions than ever before. I mean, hmm. I, I think I had stronger sense of what was good and bad before but now that i've tried so many i have almost no opinions at that's, all that's fascinating yeah. and it might just be you you kind of realize it takes time for a guitar to be understood yes. by the player yeah it's like personalities yeah you know how do you pick a personality it, i i think it would be really neat if uh it was more of a regular thing for classical guitars to perform or record cds or concerts on multiple guitars you know logistically it's it's a problem i mean yeah carrying a, five guitars yeah, to a concert right. it's impractical and, and also let's face it classical guitars are expensive yeah. you know it's hard to justify owning ted concert instruments as a younger student but it, it's uh it's something that doesn't really happen that much and i i think it's uh something i, I wish there were more people like you that were open about it yeah, well, I mean, again, I didn't record on my guitars. They were people who, you know, were lent, lent them to yeah. me. So I, um, but, and it is more work in terms of changing the mic setups for the different instruments. So it is, it is a hassle. Um, but it was, it was well worth it. And I learned a lot and it was just a lot of fun to have all those different colors at your disposal. And yeah, yeah, it was a great experience. You're a big proponent for Sergio Assad's music. And of course you've, Worked with him quite closely over the years um, when he was at San Francisco Conservatory. Mm -hmm. Amazing composer. Yeah, um, I mean, it didn't. It's 
it just happened naturally. We got to know each other and we became friends. And uh, I just thought I loved him as a person. He's one of the most wonderful people I'd ever met. And, um, and I love his, his duo. And, uh, you know, I just was attracted to everything he did. And um, so it became natural for me to uh, get involved with his music and learn more about his music. And we would, at the end of a teaching day, sometimes have dinner Mm -hmm. And he would show me what he's working on. Oh, wow. And uh, so I often would get a chance to uh, see, you know, early drafts of things, or sometimes we would read through something together. So I felt extremely privileged to be, to have that chance. And so I think it was pretty natural uh, for me to just want to learn more of his music. And uh, he would uh, take the time and coach me and uh, give me, you know, try to help me. And um, I would say over time, I got a better feel for what, you know, what his taste was and how he heard things. And I was very, very bad at it for a long time because my rhythmic feel was very stiff. Mm-hmm. And, um, and just in general, my approach was just, uh, it didn't have the flexibility and the suppleness that his music required and so i over time and i still think he would very much think that the way i play has a strong accent you know it's not it doesn't sound like you know a a brazilian player but i over time i got better at it and um and learned some of the subtleties of his accents and and uh and also he writes a lot of he tends to write with a lot of thick textures, and most of the notes have to be subliminal. You can't mo- most of us when we play his music, too many notes are too prominent, mm-hmm. and um, it's a bit like a painting. You know, if you see a painting of a portrait or something, um, maybe most of the paint is just black background, um, but you're not supposed to look at that part. So it's, you know, so a lot of his notes are just the black paint. Uh, just to support the just melody. Just to support the melody, right. And so you have to develop a way of playing. I mean, it's useful in any style, but um, of really keeping many, many notes very, very light and just bringing out a few. And you have to do it with a, a, a very precise but very relaxed sense of rhythm. So this took, you know... This was quite difficult for me, and um, uh, I still can't do it exactly right, but I I got better over the years. And so it was a wonderful chance for me to uh, improve improve my own playing and um, and just have an excuse to spend more time with him. Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting to hear, and I think it's a definitely a problem um, with a lot of guitarists just kind of anchoring down and just trying to get all the notes out and everything, right. losing kind of the rhythmic sense and this texture you're speaking of and just pounding everything they can. Because technically speaking, it's extraordinarily difficult music. Right. Um, with uh, it, I, I haven't played much of it myself, partly because I'm a bit terrified. It's amazing music, but it is tough, tough, tough to pull off. Um, and it's um, there's something special when you hear someone like you perform it where they do understand and i know you're thinking i it's something i'm still working on but it you pull it off very well it's it, it's so great to listen to someone who really has a feel for the groove of this music and it's something a lot of times i find classical players we we kind of that's one of our biggest flaws we, a lot of times we can't understand the grooves of certain styles of music and it, it just sounds very kind of flat sometimes so when that's not the case it opens things up that's partly why i love hearing you play it play his music and how long was he at a uh, san francisco conservatory i'm not i think it was seven years but i could be wrong okay something like that something close to that and you were there for i was there the whole time so, yeah yeah, it, yeah. it was i think for me it was uh 
it changed my life to, yeah. to, to be around him. Uh, it changed the way I thought about music, about I learned so much about playing, but I think the main thing was um, uh, that, you know, in my opinion, he was, he's, he's one of the great people of our field of all time. Absolutely. And, and for that person to be the most humble, the most generous, the kindest, the most natural, unpretentious person um, of all of all the players, uh, it was just you know it was a. I, it's hard for me to put it to describe that. It, um, it's refreshing. I mean, as as great as he is an artist, he's a better human being. Yeah, and to see the two combined like that um, is incredibly moving but you know i put him on such a pedestal and of course he doesn't like that no one no one intelligent or sane likes to be put on a pedestal and um but i i had him firmly on this pedestal for a long time it took me several years to just be natural about the whole thing yeah so now i'm putting him on a pedestal again in public <laughs> so i i hope he forgives me for that yeah it was uh, it's it was really one of the great privileges of my whole life and I, I've never met him myself, but everyone I talk to, I've heard the same thing. I mean, he's this genius, amazing player, of course, and amazing composer. It, it's interesting to me because th those two don't always come to hand. It, it's funny. I, I find a lot of really great guitar composers that actually can't play their pieces too well. Mm -hmm. um, well, he, Dushan Bogdanovich, and uh, Roland Dienz, I think, yeah, are the, most the greats prominent. for that. Yeah. 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 Um, but. As you said, everyone I've talked to who speaks of him says the same thing. Extraordinarily yeah. humble, kind, just it sounds like he's really a generous person with his time. He just wants to bring as much uh, positivity into this community. And it, it, it's so great to hear that because there's definitely not so much in our world. I find classical guitarists in general are very relaxed, nicer people compared yeah. to some other fields. But I agree. It's, um, it's so nice that we don't have to deal with the ego and we can just learn. Because I, I feel if someone has a very strong ego, especially as a composer, you probably aren't going to learn as much from them because they're going to be so obsessed with, oh, look how great I am, instead of just showing, well, this is what I think. And I think this could be a really neat aspect uh, to this music or whatever. It's... um. It's interesting. Yeah. I, and I, I don't want to talk down on other instruments, but there are very few, there's always some, don't get me wrong, but there are very few classical guitars who truly have a strong ego where I feel like they would wish I played poorly so then <laughs> they're, they feel better about themselves. You know, you don't, I, I, I'm sure it happens a lot, especially in competitions and stuff, but it doesn't seem to be as... Uh, prominent compared to other fields of music or professions. Well, I I mean the word ego is a complicated word. It it can describe different things. It seems to me that it's natural, especially when you're younger, to feel uh, insecure about you know what's going to happen to you. And so one of the consequences of feeling insecure is you get competitive, mm -hmm. and you you look over your shoulder about what the other person's doing and. And um, and you try to push yourself forward, or you you see it as a, a zero sum game. Yeah. And so I think it's uh, you know that's probably explains some of it, right? I don't yeah. know all. And then I think as you get older, um, if you've managed to enjoy a life of playing music and playing the guitar, then you just I think want to take pleasure in each other's company and you uh you're with people you know you're with the few people in the world who really understand and are interested in what you're interested in and uh, they tend to be talented smart people and it's a pleasure to be in their company and learn from them and get you know try to know what they think about stuff and and so it's, it becomes i think much more of a community than a, than a competition. And sharing this passion that we love. Yeah, you share this passion and, and you feel like you're sort of in it together, in a sense. Yeah. 
So uh, I think for most of us, it, it, being competitive is, uh, feels like a, a waste of time and a waste of energy, and it, it's no fun. I was just talking to Chris Garwood earlier today. Um, he's one of the masterminds, of course, behind Tone Base. And we both uh, participated um, as students, um, not, not together, it was separate, um, through this outreach program called uh, the Gluck Fellowship. And it, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but it was a great program. They, they would um, have about five or six ensembles go out into the community and do about 20 outreach concerts a year. And these range from juvenile halls to nursing homes to hospitals. And I, I was telling Chris, you know, um, not that I get standing ovations. For me, playing to, you know, I, I played at a lot of children's hospitals. But for me, it, it's so much more fulfilling to um, bring a smile to a kid like this who's going through a really tough time and just making their day feel a bit better and just bring a bit of happiness or light into their day as opposed to, you know, getting a standing ovation at a, at a concert or mm -hmm. something in a very formal setting. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it, it's very humbling. And it just, uh, when things like that happen at, um, these outreach performances, and it just reminds you what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And big picture at the end of the day, you know, most important part is, do we bring happiness into people's lives? Well, I, uh, I share your, feeling. I mean, I one of the most memorable, satisfying experiences I ever had with guitar was in a similar situation where it was at a kind of hospital slash retirement home and uh, the it's mostly older people. Yeah, retirement home. And they looked terrible when I came in there. They looked so uh, ill and uh, didn't look like any of them could focus on a concert, and 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 their how old and sick they looked scared me. I actually felt very nervous mm -hmm. just by being around so much uh, sickness. Yeah, and um, and I remember starting the concert, feeling sort of out of sorts, and for whatever reason, um, I started to concentrate well, and sort of use the music as a way of calming myself down. And then I noticed that the room got much quieter because they were very distracted at first. And I had this very rare and special feeling of like we were all very quiet and all concentrating very much together and we were all listening together. And it wasn't even so much that I was playing the concert. We were just kind of all there listening quietly to something. Yeah. And uh, after the concert, you could feel the energy had shifted in all of us. And I was told that um, by the people who worked there that their vital signs had changed for about a week after the concert. Really? Wow. And it was maybe one of the only times in my whole life where I actually felt that cliche of music having a healing power yeah you know i don't you, you read about that you hear about that it's true but though. i actually felt it and i think i've only felt it maybe once or twice um but it lasted with me it's it's when i think about you know all the concerts i've played that's the one that i remember i think one of the reasons possibly that it happened that way and I think it's one of the challenges of what we do is that a lot of times when you play a concert, the agenda, even if you, even if you don't think, you know, th there's always this agenda that's about how well you play. You know, did you play well? Oh, that was a good concert. I played well. Or that was a bad concert. I didn't play well. There's always this kind of uh, standard you're trying to achieve that you, that you think you think there's this standard. But in that situation, that wasn't what the game was about. It was just trying to feel better. Yeah. And I wasn't playing my normal game of trying to play well. I might have played well, I, 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 that, but if I did, that was just a byproduct of something else. And, and I think that might be part of what a meaningful concert's about. It, it isn't about the game of, oh, you played well or you played badly. It's something else. But 
it's very, very hard in traditional circumstances to not play that game. Thank you, Mark, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with the French guitarist and GFA winner, Thomas Vilton. Finish things up today with a piece I just discovered a couple weeks ago working on a project. This is Soar's variations off of the Folius theme uh, with a minuet. And if you don't know this piece already, you're going to be really surprised and confused when you hear the beginning of this piece. At least the theme in the first couple of variations. It's identical to the Yobet variations off of the theme of Soar. And in my opinion, Yobet named that piece incorrectly. It was really just him copying Soar's uh, interpretation of the Folius theme. Folius in the classical guitar repertoire is the most prominent popular theme to be used in variation sets. So I, I'm pretty surprised that Yobet didn't acknowledge that in this piece. But what can you do? It's another gem of the repertoire. This uh, set of variations, the sword, is very unique as it was the first variations uh, to include a menuet with the folios. And it's just a delightful and elegant finish to the piece. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Based Classical Guitar Podcast.